Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Why doesn't Jesus take credit for the miracle in our gospel text for today? So this miracle, or perhaps more accurately to call it as John does, this first of his signs, Jesus performs it, but he doesn't get credit for it. Rather, it is the groom who ends up getting credit for it. As we just heard, after the water is turned into, into the wine, the wine is brought to the master of the feast, and the master of the feast tastes it, and he recognizes that this wine is even better than the stuff that was brought out at the beginning. Uh, so those of you who have thrown big parties may have learned this in life. This was the trick that people would normally pull at this time, which was you bring out the good wine first, you let people get a few in them, and then they don't notice how much of a cheapskate you are when you bring out the two-buck chuck uh, later on. So here the master of the feast recognizes you are a far more generous man than everyone else. Look at this great, wonderful thing that you have done. And the groom who did not do this gets credit for it, not Christ. So Jesus doesn't come up in this moment and say, well, actually, uh, I wanted you guys to know that I am, in fact, the Son of God, and that that's why I was able to perform this miracle, and that's why I did it. So why doesn't Jesus do that? I mean, after all, Jesus takes credit for pretty much every other miracle that happens all throughout the Gospels. Even if there are times when he'll perform a miracle, he'll miraculously heal someone, cast out a demon, and then he'll tell them, don't go around telling everyone about this. So Jesus might not want to publicize it abroad, but he does want to, under normal circumstances, make quite clear that he is the Son of God, that this sign or miracle proves that he's the Son of God, and you should believe in him. So, why doesn't Jesus do that here? Why doesn't Jesus take credit for this miracle? Well, the answer is very simple. Jesus doesn't take credit for the miracle because he wants the groom to get credit for the wine. So to understand this a little better, it helps to understand the context of first century Jewish weddings. So uh, first century Jewish women were far more trusting of their fiancés than 20th century American women and that they gave them a lot more to plan when it came for the wedding. In particular, it was the responsibility of the groom to make sure that you were providing everything for the big festivity, which would certainly include the wine. And Jewish weddings would oftentimes last for a few days. It was a big celebration. So it is the responsibility of the groom to make sure that he has enough wine for this feast, and he has failed. We don't know why particularly he's failed. Perhaps it's because he was incredibly cheap and just didn't want to buy it and wanted to use his money on something other than honoring his new bride. Or perhaps he was just lazy and didn't properly account for the amount of stuff that he would have to acquire. But either way, the end result is the same. This man has manifested to everyone in the room, everyone is about to discover that this man does not love his new wife enough. He did not love his new wife enough to prepare for their wedding. Gentlemen, all throughout your lives, there will be times when you will demonstrate that you don't love your wife enough. But the one moment when you really don't want to demonstrate that is five seconds after you've married her. So uh, by all accounts, this is actually a pretty big deal. The fact that they're running out of wine doesn't just mean that the party is going to be ending sooner than we anticipated. It means this guy is about to be humiliated in front of everyone he knows and loves, and he's about to bring humiliation on everyone he knows and loves at the same time. So this is most likely why it is that Mary gets involved. Again, when Mary starts pestering Jesus about this, it's not so much because Mary is saying, Look, you know, we should have two days left in this rager over here, and we're about to run out of, we're about to run out of sauce, so you've got to help out here. But rather, Mary is saying, I love this guy. I know him. I've known that perhaps I've known this groom since he was a child. I don't want him to endure this humiliation, so please do something to cover up his sin. And that is, of course, precisely what it is that Jesus does. So Mary cares about this groom, and so does Jesus. He wants this groom and his bride to be at peace with each other. He just simply wants to cover the sin of this man. He wants to hide 
everything that's going to bring him humiliation. And so Jesus performs this miracle. He does a good and holy work, and he allows that work to be credited to this man because that's how it is that he is going to cover up this man's sin. So in other words, by turning water into wine, Jesus does for this man what he does for every humiliated sinner who calls on his name. So all throughout your life, you find yourself in a position fairly similar to this groom, but in its kind of spiritual character quite a bit worse. So throughout your life, it's, it's not just that you haven't done what was kind of culturally expected of you. It's that you haven't done what is required of you. So by the law of God, you are required to love him with all your heart, just as you are required to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what God demands of you. But of course, you've failed to do it. And you've failed to do it oftentimes because for whatever reason, you just simply chose to worship your own selfishness. So you filled your heart with greed and pride and covetousness and lust. You turned away from those you were supposed to help in order to serve yourself. You grew bored with the word of God. You hated it and despised it and found no room for it in your life. But whatever these sins are, these sins that oftentimes keep you awake at night, these things that you just simply can't forget, very often in your life, you find yourself living with a great deal of anxiety because you're afraid that everyone around you is going to find out. Right? Kind of like this, this groom in Cana, that the wine is running out, the clock is winding down, and at some point, people are just simply going to find out who you really are. The people you want to love you are going to find out the terrible things you've said about them, the terrible things you've done against them, and they will see in all the horrific details how much you have failed to love them. You worry that people will eventually see through the veneer of your holiness. You're afraid that people will find out that you're not actually as pious as you claim to be, not actually as righteous as you want to be seen. You're worried that people will find out that you are a fraud, that you're a liar, that you're a fake. And in all of this, you'll be filled with this anxiety and this fear of basically being outed as a selfish sinner. But of course, on top of this is the looming threat of the judgment of God. So you know that, that even if you manage to skate through this life without people figuring out who you are, you're not going to be able to do that in the life to come. So there in this moment, you worry about the day when you're going to stand before God in judgment, and God is just going to peel back that false veneer of your piety, and he and everyone who's there on the day of judgment are going to see the truth. They're going to see how much your heart was riddled with doubt. How you were filled with worry and unbelief when you claimed to be filled with joy and faith. God and everyone is going to see that you have miserably and utterly failed to do the things that you were supposed to do in order to proclaim your love for God and the world. So that's where you are, huddled in your heart and worried about this fear of humiliation. And then, out of his mercy, Jesus appears. And as that humiliation is surrounding you, Jesus does exactly for you what he did for that groom. He performs a miracle. And with that miracle, he not only covers your sin, but he credits to you everything that miracle accomplished. There, in that moment, Jesus performs a good work. And then, he gives you credit for it. So, Calvary is like Cana, 
in the sense that it's in this moment that Jesus looks out at the need in the room, and there he sees you. So out of love, Jesus stands before you, or rather he hangs before you upon the cross, and there he looks out, and he once again sees this troubling set of circumstances where a sinner who has failed to do what he should have is about to have his sins exposed before the world and about to endure the judgment of God. But unlike Cana, Jesus is, has now arrived at the moment of salvation. So you may remember that Mary comes to Jesus and says, hey, look, there's this troubling set of circumstances. Can you fix this? And Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So by that, Jesus means that the hour for him to manifest who he is has not yet arrived. And yet at the cross, we see that Cana has now directed us towards Calvary, and that moment has arrived. The moment has arrived for Jesus to manifest who he is, to proclaim to the world who he is through his miracles. And so, Jesus provides that miracle. Looking out on your life where there was water when there should have been wine, Jesus performs the greatest miracle of all. He looks at all of that sin floating around you, and he reaches out his nail-pierced hand, and he destroys that sin forever, and in the place where it once was, he gives you his righteousness and his holiness. Jesus loves you just as he loves that groom. In the same way that Christ loved that groom and didn't want his sins exposed to the world, Jesus doesn't want your sins exposed to the world, and in particular, he doesn't want them exposed before the eyes of God. So Jesus goes to the cross, and through his miraculous hands, he extends those hands out to you. He reaches out, and he destroys your sins, erases them, eviscerates them, burns them up into nothing but dust and ashes. He makes them no more. And in the place where they once were, Jesus completes that miracle by giving you his own good works. So that perfect love of God, that perfect love of your neighbor that you were supposed to manifest, Jesus Christ has manifested that through his own perfect, sinless, pure heart. And from the cross, he takes that perfect righteousness, that perfect keeping of the Ten Commandments, and he places it upon you, and he says, this is now yours. This belongs to you. I am crediting my righteousness to you. And so when you stand before God on the day of judgment, you will not hear the voice of my Father proclaiming that you are a sinner who is worthy only of condemnation but rather you will hear the voice of my Father proclaiming that my works now belong to you, that in the same way that the master of the feast looked at the groom and said, look at this wonderful, glorious thing you have done that makes you worthy of praise, in the same way God the Father will look at you on the day of judgment and proclaim the same thing. Look at this perfect righteousness. Look at this holiness. Look at all of these things that have made you worthy of eternal life. Though you didn't create these things, they now belong to you. They are now yours because Jesus has given them to you. So in all of this, Christ does what he did for that groom in Cana. He not only covers up your sins, but gives you the very thing that you need to stand before God and be declared holy and righteous and perfect and pure. And he takes all of that and says that righteousness is now yours. He writes your name upon it, deposits it into your account. And on account of all of this, that in this life, you never need to have that fear of exposure or anxiety of humiliation again. So throughout this life, if your sins are in fact revealed before the eyes of the world, so what? The judgment of men doesn't matter. The judgment of God is the only thing that matters. If people have seen throughout their lives what a miserable and selfish and cruel person you were, it doesn't matter, because in the eyes of God, you are no longer those things. 
And because of that, Jesus has given you the right to know that no matter how much hatred of this world burns against you, no matter how much judgment is heaped upon your head, you don't need to fear it. You don't need to bow before it. All you need to do is stare it in the face and say, that's the failure and the sinner that I was. But it's no longer the person that I am in the eyes of God. When you were covered in the filth of your own making, Jesus covered that dirt and clothed you in his mercy. When your failures threatened to out you as the sinner that you were, Jesus took your sins away and replaced them with his own holiness. When you were hounded by the fear of humiliation, Jesus Christ killed your shame with his blood and gave you credit for his glory, the glory that belongs to all who believe forever and ever. Amen.